Alright everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to discuss five ways to get better at homebrewing fast. So if it's your first time watching one of my videos, I just want to say welcome to you. Here on this channel, I will typically do a grain to glass video about every other week where I take a beer all the way from the recipe phase, through the brew, through the fermentation, through to the final tasting, uh, all in a single video. So you get to see every piece of that process. Uh, however, I also sprinkle in shorter, more informative videos like this one, uh, where we're just sitting down talking about home brewing. So if you like those sorts of things, please hit that subscribe button and uh, stick around for more content like this. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about five ways to improve your home brewing very quickly. If you're just starting out in this hobby, chances are you're probably making beer that's pretty good, but it's probably not as good as you initially wanted it to be. So what are some ways that you can make your beer a hell of a lot better without going ahead and spending tons and tons of money on equipment that's probably not actually going to help you out in the first place? Number one is taking detailed notes. And I'm serious, treat every single day like it's a chemistry experiment. Write down every single thing that you do in your brewing process, Every, not just your recipe, not just your ingredients. Write down things like, did I round up at the last minute? Was my pH, if you measure it, off by like 0.02 or 0.03? I accidentally left the boil going for another five or 10 minutes. Little things like that actually do add up and the more notes you take, the more you understand about what happened during your brew days. And also take notes during your fermentation. How long did fermentation last? What was the temperature involved? How, uh, how often did you see airlock activity? How long did you let it rest after your airlock activity was done? Did you keg with an open or closed transfer? Did you get things stuck in the poppet valves? Write down literally everything because all of this stuff adds up and over time you're going to end up uh, getting a better picture about what actually happened to create the beer that you're drinking now when you're finally finished with it. And if you have questions as to why does this taste the way it does or why does it not taste the way that I thought it would, uh, then you might actually have your answers in your notes. So that way when you're ready to brew your next beer or you want to brew another iteration of the beer that you just made, you are uh, well armed with information to figure out what might have gone wrong or what might have gone right during your last brews and you can improve a lot faster just by paying attention to what happened, writing it all down and learning from your experiences. I highly recommend getting a good brew journal like this one right here. I'm going to link it in the description box. But as you can see, there's a lot of space here to take detailed notes about uh, everything that you do in your brew day. And if that doesn't work for you, your basic composition notebook will do the same thing. This is actually the notebook that I used for a long time. Uh, it is absolutely full of old information um, about everything that I did well or not well. Um, there's pieces in here where I talk about how I'm experimenting doing a no-chill because I didn't have time and it was late at night and just stuff like that. Number two is going to be controlling your temperatures as much as absolutely possible in both the mash and the fermentation. The mash is a bit less stringent. If you're just doing a single infusion mash, you can have a range of like two to four degrees where you're going to be fine uh, for whatever you know style that you're actually working on at that time. I like to use a recirculating system to control my mash temperature. You can set this up for on the cheap for the most part if you have a pump. For a lot of folks out there, buying an all-in-one electric system is a good way to go to control your mash temperature, but your fermentation temperature tends to be a little bit more of a, a question mark for a lot of people. For fermentation, two to four degrees can actually make a big difference. And the first thing I want to mention is that your fermentation is going to be much hotter inside of your fermentation vessel than the ambient temperature of your room or just the temperature that's measured on the outside of your fermenter. Usually it's about four degrees hotter inside of your fermenter than it is on the outside. So control your fermentation and you can do this a couple ways. First way is to have some sort of temperature control coil that you can stick into your fermenter. Anvil makes a decent one for about $130 or you can go all the way up in the high end and get like a spike conical and a you know, $400 cooling system. Depends on your budget, depends on your needs. However, you can also control your fermentation very effectively by just simply putting your fermenter into a fermentation chamber, or basically that's just a small fridge or freezer that's hooked up to an Inkbird uh, temperature controller. You can usually get something like this on Craigslist for the cheap, and then the Inkbird's like $35. It's really not very expensive. It is an easy way to control your temperature. However, it does kind of take up a decent amount of space, so just keep that in mind. But of course, if you don't want to spend that money, and that's totally understandable, um, I did this for years. The last method is to brew with the seasons. 
So if you happen to have a part of your living space that is uh, a little bit more susceptible to the swings in temperature that occur uh, with the seasons, usually like a garage or a basement or like some sort of maybe uninsulated closet, usually these are good places to put fermenters. Because in like the fall and the winter months, you can start to brew things like lagers or English ales that like to ferment kind of in the lower range, uh, the 50s to the 60s. And when it starts to get warm outside, you can brew more Belgian beers, you could brew quake based beers, you could brew anything that likes to ferment on the hotter side. And by switching around your yeasts with the seasons, you can effectively give yourself nature's temperature control. So the third thing you can do to make your beer 10,000 times better than it was before is to control your water chemistry. Start first of all by just getting distilled water and then building a base off of that. Water chemistry is indeed kind of an intimidating subject, but there's absolutely no reason that it should be. It's actually not as hard to learn as you might think. And just to prove my point, I have a video I'm gonna link right up here in the corner where I break down everything about water chemistry on a simple level that I think most people should be able to understand. So please go check that out if you wanna learn more about the subject. All you need to do to get into water chemistry is just get some distilled water before your brew day and then add in a bunch of very cheap food grade salts uh, in varying quantities using online calculators to tell you how much you need to actually add. So it takes a lot of the work out of it. Usually I end up putting together a water profile for my beers in about five minutes. It's not very difficult to do and it makes a huge difference in the output of the final beer. Number four is going to be get feedback on your beer. Make sure you actually actively take your beer and give it to other people to taste and enjoy. If they can pick anything out about it that they enjoy, make sure you get their feedback on what they like, what they don't like, and Think about how did you do something in your brewing process that actually made them taste a certain way. For example, I have a lot of work friends and I like to get beer for me. And when I do give it to them, they usually tell me everything about it that they enjoy or not. Recently, I had a beer that I used an extract in that uh, I didn't really think through exactly how much I should have added to the keg and it ended up being an overpowering flavor. And the guy told me it tasted like soap. Make sure you have people who are actually willing to give you constructive criticism on your beers and make sure that you have a thick skin about it because there are going to be people out there that don't like your beer. There are going to be people out there who probably hate your beer and you're going to have to be okay with that, but at least get from them what they don't like about it and why they don't like it and try to use that to kind of formulate how you would brew it in the future. Again, if you had to make any corrections on that, it's important to get that feedback because otherwise you'll be brewing in a bubble basically and you're getting yourself you know, you might think your, your beer is amazing because you're the only person that's drinking it, but at the end of the day, you could get used to that. And that means you could, for example, have, you know, diacetyl in every single beer. But the more you drink it, the more you get used to that flavor and the less you think about how it actually might affect other people. So that way, when you like, you give your beer to somebody and you're like, yeah, this is the best beer ever. I make it all the time. And they crack it open. And they're like, dude, this tastes like butter. And you're like, no, it doesn't you might be used to your own flavors. So make sure you get that feedback from people and have a thick skin, that's all I'm saying. Number five is gonna be all about your yeast. Make sure you take care of your yeast and get to know it. Throughout my several years of brewing, I've used many strains of yeast. However, I tend to kind of come back to a couple different strains uh, relatively frequently because I know how they behave and I know how they perform and I know exactly what kinds of flavors I can expect to get out of them. Uh, that's something that really only time and experience can teach you. However, one of those strains is the venerable US05 slash Y1056 slash Imperial flagship. Um, these are all, this is you know your classic Chico strain ale yeast. That's a yeast that you're gonna use probably in about eight out of every 10 American style beers. So if you're just starting out, I'd suggest brewing a bunch of beers with that yeast. Get to know it, understand how it reacts to temperature, understand how it reacts to pitch rates, understand how it ferments when you give it a starter or when you don't give it a starter. And eventually you'll start to kind of get to know the yeast almost as if it has its own personality. And that will inevitably make you a lot better at predicting how your beer is gonna ferment and therefore how your beer is gonna taste. But at the same time, make sure you take care of your yeast. Make sure that as often as possible, give it a starter or pitch a healthy amount of yeast and make sure that your yeast is vitalized or awake before you actually pitch it. That's usually the reason why most people say use a starter instead of just pitching your basic you know, yeast pack in there. It's because the yeast in the yeast pack they're not really awake. They're not really vitalized. You're gonna have a longer lag time if you, pitch, if you just simply pitch in yeast out of a smack pack or out of a white labs 
uh, tube. Your yeast is probably going to end up having a little bit rougher time getting started in fermentation and you may not have as clean of a fermentation, especially if you're using yeast that's not vitalized in a very high gravity fermentation. Then you're going to definitely get some off flavors. The act of doing a starter and taking care of your fermentation's temperature keeps those yeast active and metabolizing sugars and other compounds in your wort that eventually create a great tasting beer. So that's the end of my list, but if you guys have any additional tips uh, about ways to take your home brewing from one level to the next in just a simple step, go ahead and share those down in the comments section down below. What was the best thing that you learned that took your beer from good to great? Share it with us down in the comments section down below. And if you liked the video and if you learned something, hit that like button and subscribe for more content like this. I'm active on other social media platforms. I have a uh, Instagram, it's at the apartment brewer, as well as a Patreon, which is linked down in the description box. Also down in the description box, you're gonna find uh, all of the kind of like my favorite homebrewing gear uh, that I do recommend quite readily and links to Amazon or other retailers where you can purchase those things for yourself if you happen to be in the market for it. Anyway, I'll catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.